everybody? Welcome to True Coach TV. I'm your host, Sam Pogue. I'm sitting here in Boulder, Colorado with some of the most amazing humans I have ever had the distinct honor and pleasure of getting to know. Each one of them have touched my life in a very special way and are big attributes to who I am right now. And I'm so excited to be able to share who they are, what they mean to me, and, and why we're sitting down here together. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and kick it off with Mr. Marcus Gerzi, who's been around since uh, the start of my podcast and evolving to uh, me moving to online business and even accepting my job here at True Coach. So Marcus, uh, great to hear from you. Awesome, man. Happy to be here, Sam. Thanks for having me. Go ahead and tell us where you're at, who you work for, and uh, your piece of advice uh, for yourself getting into the fitness business on day one as you are right now. Sure. So um, I'm Marcus Gersey. I run Gym Breakthrough. I'm based here out of beautiful San Clemente, California, a beautiful little beach town in Southern Orange County. And um, well, what I would say to myself just getting started is, um, you know, I guess it, it isn't what you think it is. Um, and, and buckle up. It's going to be a lot of work, but it's worthwhile. Awesome. Awesome. Next up, we have Mr. Jim Crowell, who I got to meet through one of the OPEX Big Dogs coaches and Michael Ban, And we were able to get together and do a podcast and really connect that we have a very similar strategy in the way we want to run a fitness business, yet we come from opposite ends of the spectrum. I couldn't be more farther from the truth in terms of systems and financials. And this guy comes from Wall Street and I come from being me. So Jim Crowell, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sam, and it's good to be here with everybody else. Uh, my name is Jim Kroll. I'm the CEO of OPEX Big Dogs and on the board of Brandex right now and always kind of tinkering with uh, with outside companies, so I, I enjoy kind of the diversity of all of it. Um, I would say if I were to tell myself something when I was first starting out, it's that influence is going to change, but influence is probably the most important aspect that the broad market has to see from you to connect with you. Amazing, amazing. And next up, we got Mr. Pete Dupuy, who I had the distinct honor of listening to for the first time at the Vigor Ground Summit in 2017. Obviously, knowing him and uh, his partner, Eric Cressy's work for a number of years in the systems that they built into a very close demographic to my heart in baseball players, uh, but was really inspired by Pete's story in terms of how they curate their community amongst one of the most amazing intern programs across the fitness industry, getting over 150 applicants per quarter, uh, and maybe leaving their mark on some of the most amazing sports franchises across the industry today. So Pete Dupuy, thank you. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate you having me and allowing me to learn from all of these other established and accomplished business minds. So uh, as you mentioned, my business partner is a guy named Eric Cressy. I co-founded Cressy Sports Performance coming up on 13 years ago now so as much as i still consider myself a newbie to the fitness space i guess i'm not uh, by definition but we have operations in massachusetts and florida we're building down in florida right now so we're learning some hard lessons in that process at this very moment and uh if i were to go back almost 13 years to the summer of 2007 and give myself some advice i guess i would tell myself that you're nowhere near as efficient and productive as you think you are. And uh, I thought I was busy and cranking a bunch out. And what I came to learn was uh, having kids was going to reestablish that. And uh, I just wasn't particularly good at managing my time back then. And uh, I now am from learning from, I mean, even some of the people on this, this uh, group discussion. So. That, that's probably the best piece of advice I can give is, is really evaluate your output and how you're using your time early on as you hustle to build a, a brand or a reputation within space. That's amazing. Thanks, Pete. Well, speaking of time management, and that kind of leads us to how we met the next person, and Mr. Mark Fisher, and someone who's really been an inspiration to me to really look at my time differently and the way I spend my, my years and the, what I want to portray and the message I really want other people to feel uh, when I'm with them. And someone that's incredibly you know, studious with his own business and his adventures. Uh, but thank you, Mark Fisher, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Mark Fisher. I run 
couple unconventional facilities in New York City called Mark Fisher Fitness. I have another company called Business with Unicorns where I do uh, some coaching and consulting. And if I were to give my younger self a suggestion, how it's almost like a cop out because I, I think a thing I did that worked well that I'd be like, do this thing was read widely because it's good to know stuff about programs like nutrition. It will be equally as important to understand psychology and interpersonal skills, and it will be equally under important to understand the basic functionalities of business, including marketing, sales, management, finance, etc. So it's not just the training piece, it's also the interpersonal piece, and it's the business piece. And there's some overlap, of course. Amazing, amazing. Well, it was at a Mark Fisher event that I was able to meet Mr. John Goodman, Jonathan Goodman, uh, founder of the PTDC and the co-author of what, 77 books at this point now that have been out there helping trainers get better. And we had the distinct pleasure of getting to sit in Mexico and chat business and life and connect over baseball and our love for the Seattle Mariners and Ken Griffey Jr. And we get to sit here today as amazing friends and uh, someone I look up to incredibly for what he's built and the community he's built inside of this industry. Uh, Jonathan Goodman, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Canada. Sam, I love, I love your video, Sam versus your like in-person Sam. It's just like, we're all talking beforehand and everybody's just kind of chill. And then you go into your introduction for this video. <laughs> and it's just like, it's like Dragon Ball Z level 9,000. <laughs> just like ranking up. Oh man, that was, that was fun to see. That was, that was something I can aspire to. Uh, I'm Jonathan Goodman. I run something called the Postman Trainer Development Center. We're a publishing company. Uh, we've got over a thousand articles for trainers for free on the net. I've written 10 books. Um, we've got big communities for trainers, created the first ever certification for online fitness trainers uh, called the Online Trainer Academy. I have an insane two and a half year old. And uh, like Pete, you know, my advice comes down to time management. If I were to, to go back and basically change one thing, it would just be to document everything earlier. Just write down every single thing I do in a way that somebody else could follow it way before I need to offset responsibility so that when it's time to offset responsibility, I can just basically go here, take it. Amazing, amazing. And then we come up next to the best one in Miss Jill Coleman, who I had the honor of meeting during my time at on it, but I got to watch Jill from afar, you know, whether it was MySpace and Facebook and watching her business really flourish and grow to finally getting to meet her and spend some time around one of her mastermind groups that came through Austin. And let me tell you how inspiring it was to watch her not only fire up these amazing female entrepreneurs and male entrepreneurs as well, uh, but also really give them sound advice and give them clean cut steps on how to be successful in this industry when there's so much noise out there. Uh, she's really helping a lot of people out there and really love watching the way she's grown in her career. So Jill, thank you so much for joining us. Awesome, thank you so much for having me. So I'm Jill Coleman, I own a company called Jill Fit which started as a blog, an OG blog back in 2010 um, and grew a readership over a number of years and started learning online business, realizing really quickly a business woman. I was a fitness professional and I needed to learn a whole new skill set. Um, so dove deep into business coaching, business training. And now most of my business is um, helping personal trainers, health coaches, nutrition consultants build their online personal brands. Um, and so for me, I think if I had to give a piece of advice, it would definitely be to enjoy this process on some level. One thing that I always tell my clients is take it seriously, but don't take it personally. And I think that's, that's really hard because there are moments in your business where you're going to have to pivot, where something's not going to work. You have to be able to be resilient, be fluid. Um, and so I would definitely say on some level, try to find a way to enjoy the process as you're building, because it's going to take some time and there's going to be a lot of uh, bumps in the road. So that's it. amazing. So much, so much wisdom in this, in this call or room and uh, really excited to be able to share that with all of you. So where we want to start today is, you know, a lot of the questions we get, especially even coming into our tech platform is a lot of coaches asking, where do I start? Whether it's a certification to where they even get going in their business, you know, whether, you know, we've all been in this game a few years now, but what are you guys telling coaches right now? Because I know you're all getting hit up quite a bit. Where do we start and what should we care about first when we're getting into this industry? And uh, we'll go ahead and just start it off and we'll go up to Marcus or Jim, you wanna start? Great. 
I just I don't know if we're raising hands or how we want to do this, but um, it works. I, I think what what I've seen translate the best for people is to challenge them on the product or the service that they're actually offering. So a lot of people say that they're a coach, but a coach is extremely broad at this point, particularly when you go online. And I think it's really important for somebody to look very deeply at the specific product and service that they're going to offer. Because to John's point, they can't possibly scale themselves if they don't have those systems created for the service that they're offering. And I think we'll all say, you know, or if you go to Jill, for example, and the personal brand, you can't brand yourself effectively if you're offering a service that doesn't align with the brand that you're trying to create. So I think that it has to start with the product and the service which comes back to the history and also really the underlying passion or interest or expertise that that coach has or doesn't have. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's a huge piece is to really look at what is it that I want to offer the world in this industry and, and why me, right? So a lot of you guys, I mean, you're a decade into your career now is the mission that you guys all started out on the same mission that you're working towards today. I'll, I'll tackle that one if you want, I guess. <laughs> yeah. um, I, would, I would say that my mission, my overarching mission continues to be what it was in 2007. But as far as pivots go, we have, we've taken a number of twists and turns to get to where we are. So you, you know that, that common meme that we all see where people think you've got your trajectory of, of life and professional productivity that's straight up and then you got that squiggly line that is what it reality is. Uh, I think that mission wise, yeah, my business had, has had a pretty consistent client avatar that we've been looking to help since the early stages and we've stayed on task in that mindset but we have had three, four, five different iterations of our, um, our programming philosophy or things that we've changed our mind on and things that we're willing to acknowledge. We, we had to make a pivot and move in a different direction because we found that something we were doing wasn't exceptional in the long run and we're gonna take a new approach. So uh, big vision, yes. <laughs> uh, shorter term, you need to be ready to make a number of twist turns and be open to learning from new people because it's very easy to fall into your own little bubble and say, this is the way we've always done it. And I think it's kind of like that Marshall Gold, I forget his name, but what got you here won't get you there. That's been our mindset from a program design standpoint and taking care of our athletes. Just gotta be ready to shift and change. Wow. I think a lot of people gotta enter in this industry saying I'm a trainer, I'm a coach. And very few people who enter in this industry actually are going to be exceptional trainers and coaches. You know, it requires a very, a very precise type of psychology. You know, like Sam, you're tailor made for it. Me? Uh uh. You know, if I'm around somebody for more than an hour or two a day, like I want to hide in a room by myself for a couple hours to recharge. So, like, I shouldn't be a coach. The problem is there's tons of opportunity in the fitness industry away from training and coaching, but a lot of people kind of enter in there and maybe don't stay in or aren't shown all of the different opportunities. You know, you can write, you can create a personal brand, but also like you could be a project manager and maybe support another company. I mean, you can, you can really go anywhere. Like, like any, any skill set that you have to be successful in any business you can do for a health and fitness company. And, uh, well and so, you know, don't define yourself based off of what it is that you think you do. Just say, what am I passionate about helping achieve in the world? And what am I naturally good at? And then how can I just go deeper and deeper into that while still trying to achieve this, this overarching goal of helping people get healthier, blah, 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 whatever, whatever it is that drives you. You know, it's the game of an entrepreneur. We have to learn so many skills and games, right? All of you are sitting here with so many different skills in the game that we came into when we first got into this industry. How did all of you balance this? I mean, from website design to building systems to, I mean, like all of it. Like that's, I think that's what coaches are really looking at right now is like, holy shit, I'm still trying to figure out how to be good, a good coach, let alone all this other stuff we're talking about. Any insight there, guys? I think there's- no? I'll just tackle that real quick. I think there's a difference between the strategy you should be employing as a beginner. So I can just uh, speak to coaches because that's who I work with mainly. 
Um, and I do think that if you are, like to John's point, I think if you're interested in getting into the fitness industry in a bigger way, I think starting out as a coach is a good 1.0 step. I think it's a good first iteration because you get a ton of experience. So you might not even know if you're good as a coach if you don't have that experience. So I think starting off, it's probably, and it's a super low barrier to entry. It's like I have an Instagram account, I have a Facebook account, and like that's kind of all I need at the beginning. And then I can build all the other things later. So if you're a beginner, I think the strategy a lot of times is just massive action. I, I see a lot of beginner trainers being scared because they feel overwhelmed or they feel like they're going to mess it up. I think in the beginning, there's kind of no way you can mess it up. I think you have to just take a ton of action and see what works and what doesn't. As you get more advanced as a coach, that's really what strategy is the most important. That's when systems and automation and leveraging your time and those kind of things. But at the beginning, you might be cash poor and time rich. So that's the time to kind of get a lot of reps and see what I think you're good at, what you're not good at, what you don't want to do, what you do want to do. And so if you're a beginner and you're just listening to this, I think feel free to just take a ton of action and see what sticks. I think it's really important as well that coaches recognize what they're actually doing. So a lot of coaches fancy themselves as entrepreneurs when they're not. And I think that it's perfectly okay to not be an entrepreneur if you're going to be a coach in the beginning. Um, and I, I mean, I would almost use like a Tony Robbins framework on this of the artist, the manager and the entrepreneur, right? Like if you want to be the best coach possible, you're going to be more of an artist. That doesn't mean that you can't make money in the business world, but it's not going to be you spending 12 hours a day building email campaigns, most likely if you are building yourself into the guru coach, right? You know, so you called me the systems guy, right? I don't spend all day coaching. I spend all day building out the system that allows thousands of other coaches to coach. And I think that a lot of newer coaches, particularly if they're working for somebody else in the beginning, just be the artist, just be the coach and really, really figure out to Jill's point exactly what you're great at and what you're not. And then if you find yourself wanting to move into a more entrepreneurial role, recognize that you cannot spend as much time doing that. And that's good because it allows you to scale up if that's where you want to go. Yeah, there's something about entrepreneurism that's interesting. It's like it, it suddenly became cool. I don't know, five or six years ago. You know, entrepreneur, like when I was growing up, which I mean, wasn't that long ago, I'm, I'm much younger than Pete, was, it was, <laughs> ow, ow. <laughs> it was, Shots fired. you know, it was, it was akin to being unemployed, like nobody brags yeah. on being an entrepreneur and, and I, not everybody should be an entrepreneur. Like it ain't easy guys. Um, it, it's not easy. And you know, if you decide that you want to be an entrepreneur, then you need to accumulate a, a, a certain amount of basic transferable skills and become dangerous at them. Like, like, like good enough to be dangerous. Like, like you gotta be good enough at copywriting. You have to kind of understand how email marketing, automation and branding works. Like, like these are basic transferable skills that no matter what you do, no matter what business you're in, it's gonna amplify anything you do. But, but if you're not an entrepreneur, then I, I love the analogy of the artist. Like there ain't nothing wrong with being an artist. Just surround yourself with people that you need to surround yourself to be able to amplify the art that you do. You know, don't be the struggling artist. There's no pride in that. <laughs> I think it's also <laughs> important to, I, I just wanted to say what I tell to every intern who comes to the door at our space and what I would tell any new coach to the space is to remember that you got to be a good generalist before you are a specialist. And every person on this call was probably focused on developing some strong generalist skills in the beginning. I mean, John, you yourself were a, an accomplished personal trainer before becoming the personal training development center founder. And I, I, with each passing day, I come across more and more new coaches who will come in and they'll say, okay, what's my niche going to be? How am I going to attack this? What am I going to be known for? And while I don't know that I necessarily adhere specifically to the 10,000 hour rule, the overarching concept of it does resonate with me. And I think that new trainers got to get their reps in, got to, got to really learn to take care of a pretty broad spectrum of potential clients before they start worrying about what they're going to be known for on the internet. I want to add to that a little bit. You know, I think that a lot of people, when they first come into the game, um, they try to skip steps. They see the finish line and they think about, you know, they look at someone who's five years in, 10 years in, 
and they're in such a hurry to get to that that they are forgetting that you need to build that foundation you need to just start off and be that generalist and it's okay to not be great at things and to start selling for the first time and to develop those skills and it's not a race to getting out of the day-to-day -day as quickly as you can and i'm gonna you know offload everything if you are not dangerous at it yet and you are not able to at least do it well enough on your own you should probably not be just skipping past that and moving on and just delegating it because what happens is you're not actually going to be able to effectively manage or direct that as you do start to grow and scale if you do grow and scale so i think it's uh i think it's really important to not try to just rush past and honor hey i'm new i know that it's going to take me a few years to cut my teeth and to develop these basics and that's okay and that as you start to accumulate those skills and as you start to round yourself out at whatever it is that you're doing to where you can do some basic operations, do some basic copywriting, basic selling, and you're good enough at your craft to where you can see the whole picture at once, then you can start moving yourself forward. But so many of the newer people that we come on, I work with uh, mostly a lot of CrossFit gym owners, micro gym owners who come in and it's, you know, they're in their first six months, 12 months of building their business. And they're already trying to skip to where someone is, you know, eight years in, 10 years in, when they don't even have the basics down. They haven't even identified their ideal class flow yet. They have no systems in place whatsoever. Yet they're talking about, I want to open my second location next year. It is interesting though, don't, wouldn't you say that particularly in the online market that somebody could carry very sizable influence and skip 12 steps right away and start making a bunch of money? I, sure. I think that you doesn't, can start it doesn't make them better, right? It doesn't make them better, but it's, it's, I think that there's such an interesting play that's happening right now. And I just, you know, we see this all the time, right? It's like, well, what's the first thing that you need to do? Well, you got to be a great coach. It's like, but what's your goal? Well, I want to make a lot of money. We'll just be an influencer. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it's easy to become an influencer. So not at all, but I'm wondering what, I think so many people want to be an influencer, right? And I'm not, I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying, I think that for the folks who have these huge audiences, they're going to have a very different entry point into the market. Yeah, sure. I don't think there's any way that you get around not at some point having learned business, right? So that's a different skill set. And so, you know, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you're like an influencer, you're like, I just need to get a bigger and bigger following. And that's how I'm going to make money. And then you're always kind of touting someone else's products or services. And that's totally fine as well. But at some point, there's going to be a ceiling to even that. So at some point, I think you always, if you want to be sustainable in this business, like all of you and myself have been in the industry for in some way, shape or form for like 10 years. So it's like, or more. So it's like, I think at some point you have to learn basic business skills and kind of take off your, I don't take, take off your trainer hat, but like you got to do the things to learn that side of the business. And that's a whole different skill set. And what I see with new coaches, especially is that they are, um, they want to rush the process and they're not gentle with themselves. And I like you're not supposed to know how to do this this is why you hired a business coach or this is why you're doing this business course because you're not supposed to know how to write copywriting like be gentle with yourself and so that is a whole separate skill set it's like learning a new language and so if you're new i think it's important to remember that like you might have a different entry point but at some point if you want to have sustainability you're going to have to learn those skills 100 percent a really funny thing happens whenever an industry becomes both democratized and decentralized is that everything goes a little bit nutty for a short while. And, and that's, that's what's happened in the fitness industry in the last five years. Um, like, like many industries, you know, it's become democratized and decentralized. Basically, there's no, there, there's no barrier to entry anymore, right? Anybody can create content, anybody can create a platform. When that happens, it's just a free for all and there's just a lot of trust lost in the industry because a lot of people are shouting and whoever is the loudest or who can be the loudest, which is a combination of luck and skill, um, happens, you know, right place, right time, know the right person, whatever, uh, you, you, you get there. Now, what happens is, first of all, the ability to sell at any kind of price point outside of fear and emotion is pretty small. So a lot of these influencers actually have very little ability to sell anything other than like supplements and like fat loss ebooks, which I mean, there's just kind of a cap to it because you can only sell low price at fear and emotion. You can't actually sell any premium stuff, but also 
there's, there's a stabilization. I mean, whenever decentralization happens, it's like a pendulum that just gets knocked askew. And it's just, it's just crazy. Everybody's yelling. Well, the pendulum gradually goes down to the middle. And, and basically what happens is a few people start to win really, really big. There's a whole host of people who start to win really, really small in a very sustainable way. It's the long tail effect, something by Chris Anderson, if, if you guys are familiar with it. And so that's kind of what we're coming into. It's a very stable kind of resting ground that we're going to be in for a long time because the, the most beautiful part about decentralization is eventually after this kind of readjustment period is the power goes back to the consumer because now community and, 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 and reputation and everything like that is decentralized too, which means reputation just gets kicked out. So like, again, you got to be good, which means you got to be good across the board. Right, like you got to offer a good service, you got to get people results, and you got to be good at marketing and branding and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, I'm not too concerned. I was never too concerned about the influencer market because it was always going to be a matter of time before the majority of them basically just get put out of business because they never had a business. Um, and we're already seeing that. And in the next couple of years, we're going to see that a lot more. I've got a. I'm talking to a, somebody right now that is spinning up a commercial gym business. So very, very large gyms that are actually looking at paying clients to be members. <laughs> How do you monetize that? Take that one in for a second, because I, I think that we might see a lot more of this concept coming. Imagine if you were connected to the entire healthcare industry and you were getting paid back based off of healthcare outcomes. And also imagine how much product you would sell if you had 30,000 people coming into your gym on a constant basis. So I think it's going to be a really interesting five or 10 years that are coming up to us um, where, don't get me wrong, I think digital, digital products, digital coaching, all that, I think it's going to keep going. I, I'm a big believer in the idea of Peloton's going to make a larger percentage of people try working out. I don't think that the numbers are going to go away from the gyms per se. I just think that more total people are probably going to work out. But imagine <laughs> a model Excuse me. where value is completely different. And I think that that's what, and to all of your points, that's why I asked the question. I wanted to contrary and ask the question up front. Like the value that we're going to have to define is going to have to be unique. And so I think that that's what you guys are trying to say, right? It's like, you have to have your own brand. You have to have your own systems. You have to have your own expertise because I think we're coming into a time where fitness as a commodity product is going to cost less and less and less and less. How do you know? I mean, as, as we start talking about that, we we've now really unveiled the idea that, well, we got to get really good at being a trainer. We got to at least own that element. But as we mentioned, like, man, as you really want to start growing your career, you got to start adding on some other skill sets. And a lot of people sit and wonder, A, where do I even start? And how do I know that what I'm doing is the one thing that I should be doing and I'm not going the wrong direction and inevitably going to meet my demise? How did you guys, I mean, a lot, you are, you are all sitting here because you were all just the best at beating your head against a wall the longest and survived the longest. Right. But let's be honest. Y'all have had a lot of days where you're like, this industry is hard as shit. What do we even do? How did you guys start chunking around? Like what skills do I need to learn? Why should I learn those ones? And how is that going to help me going forward? What was that decision-making process like? I think, um, if we were talking about someone who's just getting started as a trainer and we're really starting at ground zero, um, aside from just getting good at your craft, usually the first next step in my experience is to learn how to sell. And when I say learn how to sell, I'm not just talking about getting yeses. I'm talking about getting yeses for the right reason. Learn how to connect with people, learn how to, how to really um, establish rapport and, and get, get to know what the real problem is and learn how to solve problems through selling rather than just trying to talk people into buying your stuff, right? So start study human psychology, study relationship building, learn how to connect with people, building rapport, um, you know, do what you gotta do so that you can find the right, when the right people come to you that you can, you can connect with them on, in a real way, you can authentically, you know, get them to, to reveal what it is that actually matters to them and see how you can help them and, and 
learn how to sell because once you learn how to do that, I think it starts to open up a lot of doors. So I find that so many people get stuck with that. So many of us grew up with this really just uncomfortable relationship with selling and, and what it means. And we think he was car salesman or, you know, we, you know, it's just these like very aggressive, very overly direct, which often don't match the personality of a good trainer. A good trainer is often someone who just really cares about people and wants to help people. And then they're reading whatever sales book or sales blog from, you know, based on whatever was done in the fifties and sixties or door to door salesman tactics. And they're like, man, this is aggressive. And it feels really against the grain. And I think just learning, learning really how to sell and connect with people is going to get you really far because ultimately we're in the relationship business when we're training people. You want to build meaningful relationships with people so that people stick around for a long time. They refer friends and family and so on. And it's not just about getting a yes and then you know two months in they're like, this is not what I thought it was. I think a lot can be said for focusing on networking. I mean, for me, I kind of crowdsource what I'm going to focus on in the sense that I, I speak somewhat routinely to the people on this call about what they're reading, what they're doing, what they're attending. And, and that's how I make decisions as to where the direction of the field is going and what I should be paying attention to. But I didn't have any really like truly fascinating and new and exciting opportunities until I start, until I started talking to you people. So getting outside of my gym, and talking to like-minded individuals who are dealing with the same battles, just not on the same footprint of land that I am, has been immensely valuable. I have found that it is valuable to clarify your current rate limiting factor. Uh, I think it is true that when we start, you're going to generally need to kind of run around and do a lot of stuff and experiment and be a generalist. If you're going to be trained or starting with training is probably reasonable. But at a certain point, uh, when you get towards, I think, the intermediate phase, you need to start getting clear on what is the thing that's getting in my way, which uh, sometimes is a thing that long-term you'll delegate, but I think to a, a point that a few people have made, until you have some uh, uh, knowledge of how to do that, it's very hard to effectively manage somebody else Ideally, yes, you always, you know, if you want to like really be an entrepreneur, large, it's about hiring people that are better at you than those things. But if you're not at least semi dangerous with the skill set, it's hard to have somebody else to do it. I would also echo the rate limiting factor for a lot of trainers often is the sales and marketing piece. And I know a lot of amazing uh, trainers that, that love their craft and love helping people. And constantly can't ever get ahead because they just don't eat that frog, which I understand. And I'm not saying necessarily everyone even needs to, but it's very difficult because you will often see people try to throw money at the issue. So oftentimes if you're looking at a younger fitness facility, younger studio, they will often try to throw money at the problem and try to outsource it. And it's just very difficult to do it. They don't have enough sense of it because even if you try to hire outside help, say like at the digital marketing company, if you don't have an ability to be part of the process in a collaborative way, it's very difficult to get good outcomes. Now, when you start really, you know, you're starting to accrue some game plan, you're starting to put yourself out there and things are starting to go well, right? You're starting to finally like, okay, this, I might be able to even make a run at this. And then we're looking at the people on this call and being like, holy shit, look where they are in their, in their careers. How do I get there? But, you know, as, this has been something I've learned a lot in just being around a lot of your guys' events is, wow, a lot of people don't take a lot of action in fear of not being successful or not being able to make the right decision. And it was, it's been so interesting for me to hear those, those sentiments coming out of people's mouths because it's been something that I've never really been exposed to. I've always been like, if I want to go do it, I'm just going to bull rush my way in and go do it, right? But I can very much appreciate a lot of people being like, I don't even know. I'm probably going to fail at that if I try. Did you guys have that kind of feeling as you guys came through your career? And how did you guys get over that imposter syndrome to, you know, feeling a telephobia, you know, wherever those feelings were uh, that wanted to hold you back? Yeah, I was an actor for 10 years <laughs> where I just constantly failed every day, where you're just constantly told not only no, 
talk and there's like a hundred people exactly like you and we'll go with one of them arbitrarily uh and that made me i think much more resilient so that it has felt like entrepreneurship in the fitness industry is comparatively easy. um though i don't know that i actually suggest that as a game plan for anyone listening but you could i guess you could <laughs> I've sim similar for me, and I was not an actor, <laughs> clearly, um, but I was I was a commodities trader for five years, and basically the first day I showed up, they just threw me into the fire, and they said, sink or swim, you know, and I remember for five years, I was told, you eat what you kill, over and over and over and over again, and uh, I think that that was good and bad. I don't think that that was all good by any means, but I think at the end of the day, you have to trust in being able to figure it out. And I think if you trust yourself enough to figure it out to everybody else's point, you'll do what it takes to figure it out. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I, this does bug me, you know, um, and Sam, you've seen me teach this in, in OPEX courses. It's that a lot of people don't, just don't put enough time into trying to figure something out. And I think that if you've got a problem ahead of you, you've got to run through the brick wall to figure it out because most coaches who are listening to this don't have enough resources to bring a bunch of other people in to solve their problems. So I think if you can walk through these problems and learn from them and go back to John's point, you write down how you learned how to overcome that problem. That's a system in and of itself. I mean, one of my best examples of this is I just read Steve Schwarzman's book who runs Blackstone and the process that they have for every single investment decision is meticulous. It's absolutely meticulous. And so every time they make a decision, it's not just one person, it's multiple people walking through specific steps. I think if, if every person who's listening to this wants to build a business, not just one person coaching, but build a business of coaching or in the fitness industry, you have to start making better decisions over time. And so if you start to think about how you're decision making at all or how you're solving problems, you should get better. Um, and I think maybe not enough people are looking at how long that takes or the consistent refinement of that uh, over years and years to get really good at it. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, I would just say, um, you know, I think that quantity begets quality in a way. Like I do think you have to have a certain amount of, of reps to really elucidate what you should do next. So I think sometimes, um, you know, to your point, Sam, about people being scared to start or scared to like be vulnerable or, you know, feel like a fraud or whatever kind of mindset, maybe issues they're dealing with. And in my experience, it's usually the first like six months to like 18 months where like some of the biggest mindset barriers come. And then once you're there, you've kind of gotten over some of that stuff because you've just like, you just frankly fucked up enough that you're like, okay, I'm actually, there's a lot of stuff I still need to learn. And so you get, you know, you eat a little humble pie and then you kind of just settle in for the long term. Um, and so... I think that people get scared because they're looking at someone who has been in the industry for five or 10 years and going, I could never do what they're doing. The good news is that you don't have to do that yet. You just gotta do the first thing, which is the, the step that's right in front of you. And so I think that that's, instead of focusing on what it look like 10 years from now and, and psyching yourself out, I think just look at the, the first step. So what does that look like You know, for a coach that might be, for me anyway, it's for creating good content, right? talking about your services without even like being like, let's get on the phone. I don't even know that you need to run to like a call to action. I think you just need to talk about your services and to, to Marcus's point, get comfortable even just talking about what you do. I think some new trainers are so scared because they feel like they're, it's going to come off sleazy. It's going to come off like a used car sales. Like, and so I think just do the first thing. And then once you get through that first step, the second step will reveal itself. And that's kind of, at least from my experience, that's kind of how I've done things. I don't know steps from now. I just know them now. So, so let's talk about getting those reps because I was never an actor or a commodities trainer. Um, and if I'm completely honest, like I never really had any experience failing. Um, you know, like I'm, my background is, was pretty cushy. And, and I accept that. And I still had to figure out how to get over fear of failure. And so what I did is I did what I often do, which is I turn to philosophy and psychology, and I studied what fear is. And, and the best definition of fear is fear is an irrational response to the unknown. Um, Seneca once said, if you wish to stave off all fear, imagine that the worst that can happen most definitely will happen. What, what we find is that 
worst case scenarios are almost never as bad as we imagine them to be. And so if you actually define what the absolute, like, like if you were to do this thing, let's talk about like, like messy reps, right? Let's talk about taking imperfect action, quality over quantity. I 100% buy into those things. Uh, oftentimes the reason why they don't happen is because we fear the result of them because we haven't actually imagined what that result is going to be. So if we say, what's the worst thing that, that could, if everything in this goes as bad as it possibly could, what does that look like? Like visualize that. And most often than not, you'll visualize it and you'll be like, that actually ain't so bad. Well, okay, now I can do the thing. But it never happens if you don't define it first. And so that's how you start making those men that's how you start the wheel rolling and then like a big stone wheel you know once you get it going um it's much easier to do more and more and more like like i've got such a ridiculous confidence in my own ability to figure stuff out at this point because i've just tried and failed so much and come out of it okay that i just know that i'm going to figure it out well that's nine years in you're not going to start with that so you got to start somewhere and then you'll build up that courage over time I, I think maybe the best thing I could tell a new coach right now is that I have not yet got past the imposter syndrome thing and I don't intend to because my attitude is, well, one, yeah, every time I hit publish, anytime I step on stage to deliver a lecture or anything of that nature, even when I give an in-service to my team, a little bit of that's there. And the minute that stops being there, I'm too comfortable and I got to move on. I'm not growing. I, I mean, if I, if I hit publish and just think the whole world is going to eat this shit up, you're all welcome. Then <laughs> that's, that, that's the minute that I know for certain I'm in the wrong place. What's, what's so the line? I, this might've been from you, Pete. Imposters never have imposter syndrome. <laughs> no, but I'm going to use that. <laughs> Thank you for that. But I, I just mean it. It's natural and I embrace it. So. You know, sitting here now, I can say that, you know, my career has gone the way it has because I've been able to be able to connect with individuals like yourselves. And that's really set me on a really good path to get to where I am in my spot. Did you guys all have like a specific person, a specific event that really helped be a guide for you in this to get to where you are? Because I know these coaches are looking and sitting here going, well, of course, these guys are killing it. But like they must have just known this stuff going in. Right. We forget that, you know, I think people forget that we all go into the same game going like there's a lot of shit we all don't know how to do. And was someone there that to be that catalyst or, or how did that process go that got you past that hump? No one's chiming. I'll tell you, I accumulated seven years of career capital before I said a single word outside of my gym. I didn't I didn't oh. talk about what I had learned. I. I took a lot of losses before I stepped in front of a room and said, here's something I know to be true. Uh, so I, I think my turning point was the minute I got that opportunity, I only talked about what I knew inside and out. I didn't study for my first presentation. I just told my story and it's not wrong if it's your story. And so when that was well received, and I think that was the day I met Mark, that that was when I started networking and started sharing that story more and more. And uh, I think it's just stay in your lane and talk about what you know. Can I just ask real quick, Pete, how did you get found, right? Like so many people, like as I've spoken more and more in my career, you know, a lot of the question I get is like, how did you get on that circuit? How did you get your first speaking gig? And how did someone know to go find Pete Dupuy to go to go to talk on this topic? I just asked for the opportunity. So it was 2015 and uh, my former business partner and co-founder, Tony Gentilcore was headed off to the fitness summit in Kansas city to lecture. And he said, um, you know, the fitness summits obviously been through some highs and lows, but at the time it was at a real high. And uh, he said, this is a blast. It's equal parts social and learning. And it's awesome. You should come. And I said, I, I got a one-year-old at home my wife won't let me just go out and socialize in Kansas city for 72 hours. The only way I'm going is if I'm allowed to lecture and he goes, okay, let's send an email to Nick Bromberg and ask if you can lecture. And next thing you know, I went from never having delivered a lecture in my life to speaking after Brett Contreras. And it was, it was a sink or swim scenario, but I just asked, I said, Hey, can I have a shot? And they gave it to me. He Nick booked my flight that afternoon. And at that point, I was like, oh, shit, I got to figure out what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> but 
You don't know until you ask. Yeah. Was that nerve wracking asking for that opportunity? Oh God, yeah. Some of you have heard me told this tell this story, but I sat in the back of the room for the first four or five hours that day, and then I spoke after after lunch. But I had been sitting in the same spot with Dean Somerset for hours, just sitting alongside him, watching presentations, talking in between them. And Lou Schuler was emceeing the event, and at the time he started to intro me and explain who I was. And I looked at Dean and I said, check this out. And I was wearing one of those watches with a heart rate monitor and it wasn't quite so mainstream at the time. And I had a resting heart rate of 188 beats per minute. And, oh. and I'm, I'm someone who lives in that like 65 to 68 range. And, and he looks at it and he goes, holy shit, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be fine. And when I came back off stage and realized this wasn't as scary as I thought it was, and I was back to where I was, I just remember Dean, I showed Dean and I said, see, and he looks at it and he's like, can I write about that? And I said, yeah, go wild. And so I was terrified. I mean, soaked in sweat, scared, but it took me all of five minutes to realize I'm only talking about my own story that I, I can't mess this up. And I, I gave a, I gave a story called the evolution of CSP Massachusetts. And I talked about how we survived what I would call um, key man, um, I can't remember the term now, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on it, but my business partner, Eric, moved to Florida, open up our second facility. And, and I was concerned that the world was gonna come crashing down because I had to deal with the optics of the guy whose name on the wall disappeared. And I had to keep our business afloat and my God, everybody's gonna leave because Eric, this God disappeared. And we had what to this day continues to be the best six months of revenues we've ever had from the day he left until six months later in the history of the operation. And I talked about those six months and what we did. So, um, it, <laughs> again, just ask. You want your shot? The worst they could do is say no. And John just explained to all of us that is, is that really that bad? I expected him to say no. <laughs> so it's just, I wouldn't have had the opportunity had I not requested it. Yeah, two, two pieces behind uh, what Pete and John said. Um, we work with a lot of gym owners and a lot of times what we want them to do is build a bigger awareness about who they are, what they do, and you know what their gym is. And that's not a fast process, but to Marcus's earlier point, they have to be willing to get into these conversations, but for whatever reason, be it fear or potentially they just don't know what to say, they don't get into those conversations enough. And I think that if, if a coach would just you know, call it will themselves to do a couple of these, they'll recognize that the worst that can happen is, I don't know, maybe somebody screams at you and then you walk away and everything is fine, right? But I think that so many coaches would have so much more success if, they're, if they would walk out with the attitude of, I want to connect with more people. And that's, whether that's online or in person, we just constantly see that as kind of the X factor. It's those coaches and gym owners and, and people in this industry that want to connect, that have more success more consistently. To, to be fair, the worst that can possibly happen is to be chosen to speak after Mark Fisher at an event. <laughs> For anybody who's seen him talk, I mean, I don't know if there's any better speaker in the industry. And so when I hosted an event and I brought in Mark to speak, I sure as hell spoke before him, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid. I'm going to build I'm an event and I'm making him speak first. <laughs> and let all of y'all just come in right after him and be like, oh, shit, here we go. I just walk away. <laughs> I walk on the stage. But... You know, the piece I really want to look at, too, is, you know, a lot of people want to look at how do you identify the brand you want to put out there? Right, like, you know, it's, it's different, like at, at Pete and Eric's spot, you know, baseball kind of is what they're known for in that regard, but a lot of other gyms are really happen to, and not that they didn't have to build that, they did, but how do you build what your brand looks like and how do you make sure that that's what people want in the industry? And Jill, I'd love for you to start this just because I know you work with so many uh, entrepreneurs in this space. Uh, how do you how do you work with people choosing the brand that they're going to build and, and making sure that this brand is going to be something that is sustainable for them? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I don't work with gyms at all. I'd be like the worst person to help with a gym. So, <laughs> but if you are uh, if you are a personal trainer, you're working in person right now, and you want to take the skill set that you have, I do agree. I think if you're a coach, 
in a gym, whether it's a studio or a big box gym or whatever, you are sort of a generalist. We're kind of at the mercy of who walks in the door and you're like, yeah, I'll train that 75 year old man and that 19 year old kid and that postpartum mom. Like you just kind of figure it out because that's who you're, but online you get to pick your audience. And so I, I would say that if you're trying to build your online business, you do need to niche sooner rather than later. And the reason for that is you have to break through with something. You have to break through because we have this kind of trust wall online that like you kind of have to get through. And so what I see a lot of times with new trainers is because they're so multi-passionate or they had their own transformation. They, they want to talk nutrition. They want to talk fitness. They want to talk mindset. They want to talk, you know, relationships. They have all these things that they're really passionate about. But what happens is if they're talking all those things all the time, they're not ever known for one specific thing. And you want a level of familiarity of like, oh, Jill, she's the one who does, oh, um, you know, Susan, she's the one who does. Like, you just need that familiarity early on to break through the trust barrier. And then after that, you can take people in whatever direction you want to go in. Jill, if it started as an online kind of fitness and nutrition hub, and we still do some direct to consumer stuff, um, but it, we broke through with workouts and nutrition early on. And then after that, it was like, oh, actually, I, I do teach professionals how to do business coaching as well. So a lot of people come through that funnel at Jill Fit. So I think it's important to, especially when you're getting started, you have to know, and th this is what I do with my girls, is I say, you know, what are you the best at? What transformation are you the absolute best at facilitating? You could get these people a couple steps, you could get these people a couple steps, but what's the thing that like, you know, deep down and you have the experience that you just crush at and start there and own that space. And then from there, you can go in other spaces. So I do think there is a little bit of urgency to niche, especially online. Bill, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think I, I don't work with personal trainers at all. I work exclusively with gyms and the exercise is actually not that different. You know, as a gym owner, you, you solve lots of problems for people, right? We help fix confidence issues. We help people get out of pain, they lose weight and the list goes on and on and on and on. But I think that if you wanna establish a brand for yourself as a gym, what you need to do is also figure out, okay, well, what is the problem that we solve best? And it's not that you won't also solve other problems, but you need to niche down on the problem that you solve and who you solve them for best, right? Who is it that I actually can and want to serve best? And where it's easy for me to knock it out of the park for these people. And I think that starting with that first to, to build some momentum and to narrow yourself down, then you can start to say, well, what are other peripheral problems that touch this problem that we also address? And then that starts to build over time. And that's where you start to build, I think, a more comprehensive brand experience. But if we're starting from zero and we want to stand out from the noise, then find something, niche down on it, make that kind of the center point of your messaging and the problems that you solve and the content that you put out. You can still showcase the other clients that you help where it was weight loss or whatever, but maybe yours is getting people out of pain. You can still showcase all that stuff, but make the main focus around that main problem and it will, it will grow, it will evolve. And I think then over time, it will start to add on and become more dynamic over, the, over time. Yeah, I mean, to, to expand on all of this, there's this misconception by, I guess, well-intentioned fit pros that the majority of purchase decisions in the fitness industry are based on merit. And, um, and they're really not. I mean, it's just, the majority of consumers in any industry are ignorant consumers. You are, I am, like most things we buy, we don't know enough about it to actually make an intelligent decision. And so we take shortcuts. And, and for the most part, those shortcuts are fine because good enough is good enough. You know, we, we, we basically need to, to cross this barrier where it's like good enough. And so there's, there's this heuristic, there's this rule of thumb that I think is really, really uh, powerful to know of, especially as the media world gets more noisy and consumers. I mean, everybody walks into your gym already has a problem that they know of that they've probably tried to solve multiple times and either tried or failed or tried and succeeded and relapsed or whatever, right? Um, what, what you have to convince them is not to believe in you, but to believe in themselves. And so this heuristic is, is idiosyncratic fit heuristic. Basically, it, it, it translates to if this is you, then this is for you. And the better you can say that with your marketing, with your message, the better chance you're going to get a chance to help them. And with any marketing, really, you got to meet somebody where they are in order to take them where you want to go, where they need to go. 
Um, but you got to meet them where they are first. And oftentimes that has very little to do or sometimes nothing to do with actual fitness. It's an uncommon commonality that you have with them that says this is for you. I mean, that's Mark Fisher's secret sauce. You know, is, are the actual workouts you guys do that special for misfits? <laughs> you know, like, like no, they're, they're just really well put together small group workouts. Um, the reason why people come to you is, is, is that heuristic is, if this is, for you, if this is you, then this is for you. Um, and then once they come to you, now you can make a change. Right, but it's kind of it's kind of what comes first, and online and in person is is the same. The, the the difference with in person is, of course, there's location bias. So, if you happen to be in a place where there aren't a lot of other gyms around, generally you have a big advantage, um, simply because people don't want to travel that much. Whereas online, you never have that advantage. But yeah. You guys have just like fulfilled so much great information throughout this time. I know we're gonna lose Mark here in a few minutes. So I wanna make sure that we wrap this up uh, quick enough. I'd love for you guys to close out with, you know, where people can learn more about you. And I wanna know your why. Why do you continue to do these kind of things? You're well established in your career. Like I'd like to think it's just a favor for me, but also it's like at the same time, you guys continually give back to this community and helping coaches get better. And I wanna know what your why is. Uh, so where can people find more about you and what is your why, Mr. Fisher, since you got to leave, would you go ahead and kick us off? Yeah, they can go to markfisherfiz.com for the gym. They can go to businessunicorns.com for the business stuff. They can find me at mfisherfiz on Instagram where I occasionally post my dog. And yeah, I think the reason I do it, I don't know, it's kind of the same reason I got like in the MFF happened. I just felt like, you know, we... I think the way Michael, my business partner, and I approach it is just like, you know, just our own style, right? Because we're our own unique person. I think there was, there's a certain type of gym and facility owner that, uh, you know, we feel like we really like connect with. We feel like our values are very similar and it's very satisfying to help them put together those people in the same their business so that they can have like the life they want, doing this thing they love, really trying to serve something. Yeah, that gives me a little heartburn. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Pete? Hi, uh, So if you're interested in learning about my business, it's CressySportsPerformance.com. Uh, but from a content standpoint, I publish a weekly blog on Thursdays at my website, PeteDupuy.com, which I'd imagine is pretty difficult to spell if you don't know me because uh, my French-Canadian last name causes some problems, but maybe that'll be in the show notes. Uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Pete underscore Dupuy. And then to give you a feel for my why, uh, it's going to be a little confusing, but I worked in corporate before I got into fitness and I guess I haven't elaborated. I've never actually coached a training session in my life. I'm not a fitness professional in that sense. I got my MBA and I was, um, a person who knew Eric Cressy because he was my randomly assumed, randomly assigned college roommate freshman year. And we maintained a relationship as he pursued fitness and I pursued an MBA. And so when the time came and he didn't want to do any of the billing and things of that nature, I was the person he called. Um, but up until that point, I was working in a cubicle and hating life. And I can tell you that every single week I worked for the weekend. All I would do is try and get to Friday night. It's, it's all I could do. I hated work. I didn't even realize how much I hated it. But at some point I realized I spent five days busting my ass just to get to these two days and it was the moment that i noticed that on new at noon on sundays i started to see my mood change because i was that close to monday <laughs> and i said to myself holy shit all i do is live for these two days and i give away 25 percent of that weekend to feeling bad about the fact that the next week is coming and i got out and since coming into this field I've loved what I do and I, I'm excited to wake up and go to work each day and talk to people. And that's why I choose to write about it because I'm excited about it. And so if it helps people and it brings value in running gyms, I keep doing it because it's like, I can't, I can't emphasize how important it is to find something that you like. And I don't mean just like follow your passion and all this shit will figure itself out. I just mean, don't allow yourself to hate work so much that it ruins your, your well-being. 
And that was what was happening for me. So now I give back in the sense that I found something I like, I want to talk to you about it, and maybe you'll get something out of it too. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> it does, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. Jill? Oh, can't hear you. Um, there's a bunch of like trucks outside, so I was muting myself. Mm. Um, uh, you guys can find me at JillFit, JillFit.com, and JillFit on all the socials. Would love to talk to anyone who wants to shoot me a DM. And if you're a new trainer, would love to, to get to know more about what you do. Um, I think my why is, is kind of similar. I mean, obviously, it's we're in this business because we do want to help people on some level. For me, um, I look at business. It's like business is kind of a hobby to me. I really enjoy the puzzle that it is to me especially online business because it's changing all the time. And to me, I have a mantra that I use that I can see it as a pain or I can see it as a puzzle. And that has helped me pivot when I needed to pivot to do things differently. I came up in the kind of the golden age of blogging and it's just it's not producing like it once did, obviously. So it's, it is a, a passion of mine. It's just like learning any other skill or hobby. Um, and I enjoy trying to get better at it so I can uh, teach that to my clients and help them get to their next level and see them leave their full-time job, have more time with their kids, be able to take a vacation and not lose money. Like those kind of things are really important. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Mr. Goodman. Hi, this was fun. Uh, where can you find me? Personal Trainer Development Center, any of the social media stuff. That's cool. Uh, I also have onlinetrainer.com. That's a lot easier to type. It's basically the only reason I bought it. Uh, what was the other question? Why do I do this? I guess yeah. why, do you, why do you keep giving back? Well, well, why do I do this call is because I really like you, Sam, which I think actually says a lot. Um, to be honest, I, I, I don't do many podcasts and stuff like that. Um, simply because it's, it's, it's hard to justify them. and I'd rather write books. And, uh, and I do this because I really like you. And, and we've actually spent time together and had real conversations. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for that. In terms of why I do what I do, I mean, I won't give you the professional answer that I really, you know, I feel like it helps people and it's my purpose and stuff like yeah. that. Um, I, you know, I, I'll give you the answer that I would give to, to a good friend of mine if they were to ask me, which is, uh, it's selfish. I, I love to create, I love to explore. I think that I'm really an explorer at heart. I mean, I've spent four to six months out of the country with, with my wife and now son the last seven years, um, living in different places, really all over the world. Uh, it's just exploration, it's creativity, it's just, being able to build interesting things. Um, I love doing that selfishly for me. And, and I'm happy that other people get benefit from them. But really, sure. what drives me is just I want to keep doing it, man. It's just, it's just yeah. fun. Amazing. Amazing. Jim, what's yeah, up? Easiest spot is probably opexfit.com uh, for all those and social, web, etc. I'm just at Kroll Jim. And actually, funny enough, probably the most time I spend socially is actually on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm just Jim Kroll on LinkedIn. I don't know why. I just like it. Um, I, I think I, so similar to P that, you know, I, I got my MBA as well. And I, I've always used that concept of investigating business. Like I didn't, I didn't go back to school for the degree. I went back cause I actually wanted to learn it. And, and I think that, um, what I love in this industry is that it's fast paced. It's constantly changing. It's massively underestimated, I think, by a lot of different types of people. And so there's tremendous opportunity. And so I see that, you know, similar to John, it's, there's a capitalist inside of me that's like, hey, uh, I kind of want to investigate this thing that might have incredible upside potential, not just monetarily, but um, imagine if health and fitness really do merge in the next 10, 20 years, imagine the, imagine how interesting that will be. And so I'd like to be a part of that, that ascent uh, in how the industry is actually formulated. And I think it's happening already. And we're going to see it just go really, really, really fast as technology merges with a lot of people talk today about the psychology of it. That's now becoming known. So it's like all of this is going to start to merge and try, and we're going to have to be at the the center of that conversation if we want to help really spin this thing up. And I love the investigation behind that idea. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. 
Mr. Gersey. So you can find me at uh, jimbreakthrough.com um, or you can find me on any of the uh, social channels as uh, Marcus Gersey, that's M-A-R-K-U-S-G-E-R-S-E-Z-I. Um, why I do this, um, you know what? I grew up with two parents who ran service businesses who never really broke through. And although they loved what they did, you know, they, they spent their entire lives serving people and being phenomenal at what they did. I always just saw how much more they wanted to achieve and how they, they never really got to that, that end game. And as I got into my career um, and, and started working with small business owners 12 years ago, and I just started to see these commonalities and it was just this driver for me to help people break through. Uh, because I, growing up around that, just always made it my mission to not end up like that. I love service. I love people. I love helping people and help people do things that they didn't know were possible. And so I've spent my career cultivating those skills and, and experiences for myself um, so that I can help other people realize their full potential and really build a career doing something that they love doing. I think there's way too many people in this industry who get into it, who are passionate, they're excited, they want to make an impact, they want to help people, they've got the skill, they've got the drive, but they don't have the tools necessary to go from rookie to pro. And we lose a lot of really talented people because of that. And we could be making a much bigger impact if we can help more people be successful and really build a long-standing career with us. So that's why. How about that's you? Amazing. Oh man, you know what? Mine is that, you know, I fell into this industry in 2008 and I did not intend to be in fitness at all. And it was through the fitness industry that I've been able to complete, not just complete, but beat the shit out of the job I dreamt of as a child by the age of 32. I dreamt of owning a major league baseball team. And at this day, at this juncture point in my time, I get to train one of the most decorated baseball players to ever play the game. And he's one of my best friends and I get to do a lot of cool things and that's opened up a lot of opportunities for me and for me coming from you know I went to school for entrepreneurship to evaluate startups if they were going to be successful and for me to come into this industry and to have some of the opportunities that I've been blessed with in my career to turn around and not help other coaches be successful who really want to be in this industry who really want to help people I think that'd be a real dick move on my part so I really want to help as many people as I can because we all deserve to be happy at some level some people need that through their fitness to be happy. Some people need their business to fulfill them. At the end of the day, you know, we're all searching for something and this is just all of our vehicle to help the most amount of people and be the best citizen of the world. So it's been a real pleasure to be able to share this time with all of you. I look up to all of you so much and really admire everything that you guys do. Thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to spend with all of us, to teach everybody else your ways and to share your wisdom. And I appreciate each and every single one of you. Thank you so much. Have a great day.